with Frozen Empire returning the ghost busting action to New York City, while also celebrating 40 years of the franchise going back to the iconic first Ghostbusters film in 1984, this is kind of the perfect time to take the big moments from the franchise, put them all down on one handy timeline. Now for those keeping score at home, we're drawing from the main movie canon timeline of Ghostbusters, which means Ghostbusters 1, 2, and Ghostbusters Afterlife, while putting some key moments from the 2009 Ghostbusters video game and the animated series, The Real Ghostbusters. Properties like the Extreme Ghostbusters animated series and the video games it spawn, and comic books like the IDW line and the 2016 reboot movie are not considered part of the official canon and therefore they're not represented here. So apologies to all those who spent 1997 getting extreme with the Ghostbusters. All right, without further delay, here's the complete Ghostbusters timeline. To fully cover the Ghostbusters timeline, we gotta go back a little bit. Well, actually like a lot of it, to the year 6000 BC. This is when it said that Zul was worshiped as a demigod by the Sumerians and the Mesopotamians. This was the first known record of Zul, a minion of the god called Gozer. Then just past the year 4000 BC, Gozer took the form of a Torb, a semi-serpentine Goliath during the rectification of the Voldranail, an event that saw the Voldranail, worshippers of Gozer, destroyed by their god, showing what Gozer is truly capable of. Starting with the year 1381 AD and up to the events of World War II, events took place that are said to have contributed to the countdown of the coming of Gozer. But back in 1505 AD, Prince Vigo von Homburg Duschendorf is born in the Balkan Kingdom of Carpathia. But as cool as that name is, we all know him as Vigo the Carpathian. In 1610 AD, Vigo the Scourge of Carpathia, according to his subjects, is executed by said subjects. He didn't die of old age either. He was poisoned, stabbed, shot, hung, stretched, disemboweled, drawn, and quartered. Ouch. Before being put to death by literally every form of death that you could imagine, he warns, death is but a door, time is but a window, I'll be back. And he's not lying. We know this from the occult reference net. Back in 1855 AD, Ivo Shandor, the former surgeon and architect of 550 Central Park West, is born. He's most known for being the leader of a cult that worshipped Gozer that he founded in 1920 after he determined that society was too sick to be allowed to continue. His Shandor Mining Company, founded in 1927, led to the construction of the small rural town of Somerville, Oklahoma. So, you know, put a pin in that one. We'll come back to that. Other than the tragic incident in Somerville during May of 1945, an incident in which mine workers jumped to their deaths inside the main shaft of the Shandor mine, called the Shandorian Curse, the timeline takes us pretty much up to 1984. Doctors Egon Spangler, Ray Stentz, and Peter Venkman swing by the New York City Public Library to check out a reported haunting. After witnessing a symmetrical book stacking, they run into the very nice and peaceful gray lady ghost haunting the premises. Oh, just kidding, she was very not friendly but then they find themselves a little bit of a pinch because they're fired. This happens after their grant at Columbia University is terminated and they're unemployed thanks to the Dean not quite believing in their paranormal research. With no one to take their findings to, Egon, Ray, and Peter decide to start their own professional paranormal investigation and elimination service. I believe that we were destined to get thrown out of this dump. Ghostbusters is born. Meanwhile, Dana Barrett, a symphony orchestra cellist, arrives at the 550 Central Park West building, groceries and cello in hand, and makes her way to the 22nd floor apartment. That is when she witnesses her first paranormal activity. Her TV was left on despite her knowing she had turned it off. Then the eggs she bought fry themselves and she hears grumblings from the refrigerator. Seeing a bright light coming from inside her fridge, she opens it to find a mythic temple-like pyramid and a terror dog staring at her from another dimension. The terror dog bellows the name Zool and she shuts it in a panic leaves the apartment. So while Ray and Egon begin to research who this Zool is, Peter, ever the um, romantic opportunist, I guess you could say, heads to Dana's apartment to investigate. Making unwanted advances while using the ghost sniffer, Dr. Venkman finds no traces of anything paranormal there. Dana has to force him out of the apartment. Seriously, Peter, stop. No means no. The Ghostbusters are a company without clients and close to going under, but their fortunes change when they get a call from the Sedgwick Hotel. While on the sea at the hotel, the boys in gray fight and get slimed by a ghost they would one day known as, uh, shocker, Slimer. After a lot of destruction and noise and a warning that they should never ever, and we mean ever, cross the streams of their power packs, they capture the devious Class 5 full roaming vapor ghost and in the process become wildly successful. 
business is booming. So much so, in fact, that the Ghostbusters need to add a new member. Soon, Winston Zedmore was hired on the spot after coming to the station after seeing a wanted ad. A blue-collar worker with a love for his city, Winston would be involved in every major moment with the Ghostbusters. So, with an entire city very much aware of who you're gonna call when the ghosts appear, the Ghostbusters are very busy doing what they love, busting ghosts. But the booming small business gets the unwanted attention of the government. That's right, the Environmental Protection Agency has set its sights on the Ghostbusters and the EPA's own Walter Peck arrives with all of his big government regulations. Peck wants to inspect the storage facility at the firehouse and Peter refuses him access. And while the Ghostbusters worry about keeping the government out of their business, Dana's phone call with her mom is interrupted by claws that burst out of her chair and she becomes possessed by Zool, the gatekeeper of Gozer. I mean, yeah, that happens sometimes. Down the hall, Lewis Tully can't enjoy his accountant anniversary party on account of a dog or bear or cougar, whatever the sound is, causing problems. The terror dog, aka the Keymaster of Gozer, chases Tully to a nearby restaurant where it possesses him. New York in the 80s, man. These streets weren't safe. Peter shows up at Dana's apartment for the date he coaxed out of her to discover the object of his desire is now possessed by Zool. He, of course, learns this when Dana tries to seduce who she thinks is Gozer's Keymaster instead of rebuffing him and levitates in the process. Peter rejects the advances and hopefully he learned a lesson from this. The now-possessed Lewis stumbles around New York City looking for the gatekeeper, Zool. Confusing a carriage horse for a mini of Gozer, his unusual behavior puts him in the custody of the NYPD, but they turn him over to the Ghostbusters on account of his strange behavior, because that's how the law works. He isn't there for long, though, as Walter Peck returns to the firehouse the next day with the law on his side. Literally, he has a court order to shut down the containment grid, and he does. This frees hundreds of ghosts, and they rush into the city. This supernatural kerfluffle allows Zool to awake from Dana's bed and allows the terror dog to escape. Reunited at 550 Central Park West, Zool and the terror dog share a passionate kiss as Dana and Tully. The gatekeeper and keymaster are reunited, meaning Gozer can return just as the city is being overrun by the recently freed ghost. Which is why it's not great that Walter Peck has the Ghostbusters arrested. While in jail, the Ghostbusters decipher that Dana's apartment building was designed and built with a superconductive antenna designed to pull in and concentrate spiritual turbulence. The mayor of New York City orders the Ghostbusters to be released and they try to explain it all to him while the dastardly Walter Peck argues against them. The Ghostbusters watch helplessly as Dana and Lewis take their terror dog forms as Gozer emerges in a female form. Easy, just shoot her with those fancy power packs that would become great toys for kids everywhere one day. But it doesn't work. As Gozer disappears, the god tells them to select the next form it will take. The Busters try to empty their minds except for Ray. He thinks about the most innocent thing he can, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. A simple, cute corporate logo. And that is famously the form that Gozer takes. As the Marshmallow Man version of Gozer climbs to the top of the apartment building, Egon realizes that the only chance that they have to defeat Gozer is to do what he warned against. It's time to cross those streams, baby. Doing so would create a total protonic reversal and hopefully destroy Gozer and the interdimensional gate. Oh, and it will most likely kill them in the process. I love this plan. I'm excited to be a part of it. Let's do it. The gate explodes. Gozer's melted in a marshmallow fluff. Dana and Lewis return to their human selves. And best of all, the four Ghostbusters are alive and kicking. Now here's where things get a little interesting in the telling of the Ghostbusters tale. Following their defeat of Gozer on top of 550 Central Park West, it's agreed that the Ghostbusters did in fact go on to have many more adventures all around New York City, and perhaps even the world. Let's say this. From 1986 to 1991, the adventures of the Ghostbusters, sorry, the real Ghostbusters, were recounted in a popular cartoon. Most of it just doesn't add up to the story we know. In 1986, Dr. Peter Venkman was interviewed by reporter Cynthia Crawford, and he told her, and therefore us, what happened right after the return to the firehouse following their world-saving victory over Gozer. With the firehouse damage and the ecto-containment system destroyed, the Ghostbusters had to get right to repairing everything and looking to the future. Here, they got new uniforms and a new friend, as in the ghost from the Cedric Hotel, that we would know now as Slimer. And this is where he got his name. Slimer proved to be a friendly ghost who just wanted to enjoy a good snack now and then, and he proved to be a help in tough situations. Egon determined it was a good idea to keep Slimer around so he could study him. Hey, a friend and a lab rat. Good idea, Egon. When Venkman fails to get rid of their old suits, ghostly doubles of the Ghostbusters try to vanquish our heroes and take over. But with Slimer's help, the Ghostbusters defeat their spirit world doppelgangers, and they're on their way to a series of wild animated adventures. And while we take that starting point as true, 
the line seems to split from there. There are countless adventures to look at, including the Ghostbusters preventing an eternal Halloween, running into Ebenezer Scrooge, and battling a cult of Cthulhu. The Ghostbusters even left New York City to fight ghosts and spirits in places like Tombstone, Arizona, Scotland, and even Transylvania. But why don't we hear of these tales when we all meet up again with the Ghostbusters in 1989? Simple. At some point in the timeline, things seem to split, and these aren't the Ghostbusters we know. These animated Ghostbusters claim that the stories we're all familiar with come from a movie that was based on them starring some guys named Murray, Aykroyd, and Ramus. He doesn't look a thing like me. Oddly enough though, later in the animated show, the events that take place after 1989, that whole Vigo the Carpathian thing we're about to get to, did happen in both timelines. Confused? Go grab an ecto cooler and just forget about it. Now while the timeline itself seems to cross streams a little here, what is true is that things for the Ghostbusters we had come to know in 1984 have started to turn a bit sour. Though they saved the city in 1984 and went on to more adventures, late 1989 finds the Ghostbusters in a bit of a downswing, as in, the Ghostbusters have been shuttered. This was the direct result of the Ghostbusters being sued by New York, as in, the entire city, the county, and the state ended up getting sued by every state, county, and city agency in New York. For damages caused by the Ghostbusters during their final fight with the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, aka Gozer, because all those cheers didn't mean shit. Additionally, the Ghostbusters were served a judicial restraining order barring them from conducting paranormal investigations and eliminations, and that will definitely put a Ghostbusting team out of business. The former Ghostbusters are now scattered throughout the city making do. Ray and Winston are on the children's birthday party entertainer circuit, and it's not going well. Peter Venkman is the host of a not-so-popular TV show, The World of the Psychic, and is single after his relationship with Dana Barrett ended some time ago. At least Egon is still in the scientific world, studying human emotions. And it is to Egon and his office Dana Barrett goes after she experiences a terrifying event in which the stroller of her young son Oscar seemingly moves on its own. Oscar's not Peter's son, by the way, so don't worry about that. Egon is interested in helping Dana, but wants to get Ray involved. Dana agrees, but does not want Peter involved. Things, uh, yeah, they didn't end well. After the latest episode of The World of the Psychic, Peter tries talking to the Ghostbusters gang and the mayor of New York, but runs into our new bureaucratic villain, the mayor's assistant, Jack Hardemeyer. We also meet Dana's boss at the Manhattan Museum of Art, Janos Poha, who keeps making unwanted passes at her while she's trying to do her job of restoring paintings. Men, do not do this. Speaking of troubled men and Dana's life, Peter shows up at the bookstore owned by Ray and discovers that they are researching the problem Dana reported to them. The plot immediately begins to thicken when their research takes them to the spot where the stroller stopped after seemingly operating on its own power. They get strong readings, drill a hole in the street, and discover a deep shaft that begs for further investigations. All of this is a violation of the judicial restraining order against them. All of it. Unbelievable disregard for the rules, boys. Meanwhile, creepy Janos is about to get even creepier as he touches up a 16th century painting of Vigo the Carpathian. The painting shocks him and comes to life, orders Janos to locate a child, any child, so it can possess the child, and then takes over Janos himself. None of this is a violation of any restraining order. Yet. Seeing as Janos has Dana on his infatuated brain, he now seeks her Oscar as the child to get possessed. Back out in the city, or rather underneath it, Ray discovers a river of slime flowing under New York and collects a sample. However, Ray is pulled back up to the surface, but not before kicking a pipe that falls onto a power line that shuts down all the power in the city. I mean, the poor design plan is not exactly Ray's fault, right? Well, it is. And as we said, they are in violation of the restraining order. The Ghostbusters are arrested. Which is not good, because Dana is left unprotected and the possessed Yano shows up to see if he can, you know, just take the baby. This time, he's turned out. The Ghostbusters are put to trial the very next day. Like, the city really doesn't like them. Their defense is being led by everyone's favorite former accountant and Gozer Keymaster turned bad lawyer, Louis Tully. Naturally, they're found guilty. But when the judge overseeing the trial starts angrily insulting America's former ghost-busting heroes, a slime sample in the courtroom starts boiling and then explodes. This releases the ghosts of two murderers ghost skeptic Judge Stephen Wexler had previously executed. This allows our heroes to do what they do best, bust ghosts. With the day saved for the judge, he dismisses all the charges against them and wipes out the restraining order. The Ghostbusters are back in business, baby. This is a good thing because the weird slime is now all over the city. 
Research on what Peter names mood slime reveals that it reacts to negative emotions, threats, insults, verbal abuse, everything seems to fuel it, though it also reacts to singing and uh, other things. At the very least, they know positivity can affect it too. There's more work to be done, but Peter heads out to bother Dana at work. She says that she feels like the painting of Vigo is watching her, the same painting that Janos seems to be talking to. Creepy. Later that night, Dana and Oscar are attacked by a bathtub filled with pink slime and she flees to Peter's place for help. Love is blooming all around as Lewis asks everyone's favorite administrative assistant Janine out at the same night Peter and Dana go to dinner to rekindle their romance. Janine and Lewis end up babysitting Oscar while Peter and Dana head for dinner. Now realizing the connection between the painting of Vigo and the recent paranormal activity, Egon, Ray, and Winston investigate the River of Slime. They find it after running into a ghost train sent by spirits to keep them from finding the river. Winston is promptly pulled in and Ray and Egon jump in to rescue him. The river takes them to the museum where all three start fighting with each other influenced by the negative energy of the slime. They eventually take the information to the mayor at the historic and of course haunted Gracie Mansion. They tell him that the people of New York need to start being more positive or the entire city will succumb to the effects of the River of Slime. Supernatural activity would explode out everywhere. The mayor isn't buying it. Being miserable and treating other people like dirt is every New Yorker's God-given right. Jack Hardemeyer, the jerky jerk who loves to jerk, plays nice with the Ghostbusters and suggests that they speak with the people downtown instead of going to the press. And wouldn't you know it, Jack set them up to speak with folks at the Parkway Psychiatric Hospital. That's right, the Ghostbusters are going to an insane asylum. Meanwhile, on New Year's Eve, Janos, still under the control of Vigo, kidnaps Oscar, causing Dana to chase after them. She goes to the museum where she finds Oscar on an altar before Vigo. The slime is now covering the museum and slowly taking over the streets. That's when the mayor discovers that Jack the Jerk did. God, what a jerk. The mayor fires Jack the Jerk and releases the Ghostbusters. We're set for a grand finale, y'all. The Ghostbusters can't break through the slime to get into the museum to stop Vigo from becoming reborn in Oscar's body, and that is when they determine that they need a positive symbol to turn the city's negative energy into some good vibes. So naturally, they animate the Statue of Liberty via positive slime and blast your love keeps lifting me higher to raise everyone's mood. With the slime weakened, Dana saves Oscar as the Ghostbusters neutralize Janos with positive slime and face off with a fully armed and operating Vigo. Things start going haywire and Vigo takes Oscar again. But the newest member of the Ghostbusters team, Louis Tully, that's right, Janine put on one of Egon's jumpsuits on Louis and he's official, benefits and all, joins the citizens in a rendition of Old Lang Syne. The positive vibes and New Year's cheer weaken Vigo even as he possesses Ray. Winston uses the slime blower to drive Ego out and back into the painting. Egon and Peter finish the job and Vigo's dead. Again, Peter and Dana kiss, Ray's happy, Janos is happy, the Ghostbusters are happy, the entire city's happy, even Jerky Jack is happy. 1990 is starting pretty damn good for the Ghostbusters. By 1991, the Ghostbusters were still going strong. In fact, they now have a contract with the city to handle any paranormal investigations and all the work leads them to bring a new rookie to the team. And that's a good thing as the city explodes with activity and a psi energy blast at the Museum of Natural History has set Slimer free from the Ghostbusters firehouse. And with that, the team is off on a wild adventure that begins with tracking Slimer down at where it all began in 1984, the Sedgwick Hotel. Soon they have to battle Gozer and the somehow returning Stave Puff Marshmallow Man who's after a new name to our story, Dr. Alyssa Selwyn. From there they run up against their old nemesis, Walter Peck, forced to work with them by the new mayor and uncover the full story of the Grey Lady ghost that they first ran into in the New York Public Library. She was once the former chief librarian there and she was murdered by her ex-lover known as the Collector. She haunts the library protecting a Gozerian codex that the spirit of the Collector wants due to his connection to Gozer. <sighs> it's always Gozer, isn't it? Always. The team ends up fighting the spirit of the Collector in the ghost world who has taken the form of the demigod Azitlor the Destroyer. They clear out the museum and fight two Gozer cult leaders called the Chairman and the Spider Witch while also discovering that there are nodes all around the city that these gods were protecting. The nodes act as a bridge of sorts between the real world and the spirit world, and the nodes draw in ghosts that feed into the destructor form like the one Gozer takes. All this could lead to really bad news for New York City. Man, this city is just not safe. I would not live there. This all leads them to the final node, the hidden island mansion of Ivo Shandor. Remember, the guy who built the 550 Central Park West building with selenium bars? 
Turns out, Dr. Selwyn is a descendant of Shandor, and her presence seemed to trigger all of this, including the possession of the mayor, Jock Mulligan, by Shandor himself. Plus, the rookie discovers that Shandor's castle had been producing the slime that had previously affected the city in 1989. Dr. Selwyn is kidnapped by the Shandor-possessed Walter Peck, and this leads to a final fight in Central Park and the Ghost World. It's revealed that Ivo Shandor was upset that Gozer had now been defeated twice by the Ghostbusters, so he took over and wanted to deal with them himself. But he doesn't. He loses. Really bad. The Ghostbusters cross the streams despite Egon saying way back at the beginning to never cross the streams, and Shandor is seemingly defeated. Dr. Selwyn and Walter Peck are freed, and the rookie is offered a chance to start a Ghostbusters franchise in another city. The city is saved, and no other hauntings are reported from 1991, until the year 2021. By 2021, the Ghostbusters had long disbanded, but well before then, Egon Spengler had moved to Somerville, Oklahoma to pursue one last threat against the world. This obsessive pursuit had pulled Egon away from his family, specifically a daughter, Callie, whom we'd all had never knew he had. The pursuit also cost him his life. Though reported to have died of a heart attack just a week before this part of the story, the truth is that Egon died while trying to defeat two entities found in Ivo Shandor's mine near the city. He captured the first, but an elaborate trap system set up at his rural home fails and Egon suffers a heart attack while being attacked by the second creature. His death leads to his long-lost daughter and her kids, Trevor and Phoebe, moving to the farm. But the mystery is slowly unraveled as Trevor uncovers the neglected Ecto-1 in the barn. And Phoebe makes contact with a poltergeist that is her grandfather Egon, and soon learns of her family lineage and connection to those famous Ghostbusters from the 1980s. With the help of their new friends, podcasts, Lucky, and the local summer school science teacher, Gary Gruberson, who has eyes for Callie, Trevor and Phoebe find themselves deep into the final battle their grandfather had started. They've got an up and running Ecto-1, a working proton pack, and a functional ghost trap. They're almost like the new Ghostbusters, you could say. Then they get arrested for causing property damage while trying to trap a ghost. Nope, they definitely are the new Ghostbusters if they're getting arrested. Using their one call from jail, Phoebe dials the phone number the world used to call, 555-2368. And if it's a 555 number, you know it's real. She gets a hold of Ray Stance. He wasn't aware that Egon had just passed, which is tragic because Egon's obsession with the threat of the existence of the world itself had pulled him away from the rest of the Ghostbusters and business dried up. Ray, Peter, and Winston seemingly never believed their narrow focus friend, but Phoebe tries to explain that it's all real. They captured a ghost and problems are brewing in the mountain. Callie is still resistant to any warm feelings for her father or picking up any ghost hunting trails. But the situation is growing out of control as the terror dog and hundreds of cute little demonic Stay Puft marshmallows have emerged. Something Gary finds out at the local Walmart shortly before he is possessed by the Keymaster of Gozer. Phoebe and her new friends get us up to date on some of the history previously unknown. Evo Shandor? He built this whole town. He used selenium beams from his mind to build the apartment building at 550 Central Park West. Shandor, a Gozer cultist, had been playing the long game to serve Gozer. They then descended into Shandor's mine and discover a working death pit, a list of years connecting big world events to the countdown to Gozer's coming, and Ivo Shandor himself alive in his casket. They also learn that Gozer can't cross over to our world thanks to automatic proton cannons set up previously by Egon. Meanwhile, after being led to Egon's workroom, Callie is possessed by Zool and heads off to the mine to connect with the possessed Gary and clear the way for Gozer. Phoebe realizes that Egon's farm is not a farm at all, it's a trap, and that her grandfather was here to finish what the Ghostbusters had started in 1984. With the town of Somerville now under attack from the supernatural, the next generation of Ghostbusters spring their equipment from the police station, with a little help from Munch the Ghost, and head off to save the city. They witness the possessed Callie and Gary perform the same ritual Dana and Lewis did in 1984, bringing about the return of Gozer. Ivo Shandor's long-held plan has finally come to fruition, and they can rule the world to Oops, he's dead now. The new team comes close to saving the day, freeing Callie and weakening Gozer, but the plan doesn't quite go as planned as Egon's farm trap doesn't work again. Gozer frees Zool and is back at full power, and now Lucky is possessed by Zool. All hope seems lost until the original Ghostbusters return to join the fight. The big victory isn't exactly guaranteed, though, as Gozer resists the proton packs and the crossing of those fabled streams. But Phoebe stands strong against Gozer, and with some help from the ghost of her grandfather, Gozer is held back long enough for Trevor and Callie to activate the farm trap. 
Lucky and Gary are freed, Gozer and all their minions are vanquished, and Egon can peacefully transition to the afterlife. We return to New York to find that Peter and Dana are married, and the last thing we see is Winston returning the Ecto-1 to the Ghostbusters firehouse he has now purchased, where it is sitting when the Ecto containment unit comes to life with a flashing red light. And now it's time for the Ghostbusters to answer that call once more to stop a brand new Ice Age. And that's what we know about the Ghostbusters from 1984 and before all the way to today.